We're now going to talk about 18th century women artists, and at the very end, there'll be a woman who uh, starts working in the 18th century and continues on into the 19th century. You'll find that there is uh, a variety of things that women are doing in the 18th century. They're portraitists, they're still life painters. Uh, we're even going to talk about one genre painter. The first artist we're going to talk about is Rose Alba Carrera. Uh, she's a Venetian artist. She lives from 1675 to 1757. And she's particularly known for her pastels and uh, also her miniatures on ivory, which was one of her innovations. We see she's, she is uh, technologically innovative in a certain sense. Uh, she's born in Venice. Uh, and she has success in Venice, Paris, Vienna, really all over Europe. She is actually one of the originators of the Rococo style in France and in Italy. The Rococo style is what we talked about is uh, the light, airy version of Baroque uh, that uh, is so popular in the 18th century and is particularly associated with court circles. Her origins are fairly humble. She was the daughter of a lace maker and a clerk. And it is speculated that as a child she would draw lace patterns for her mother. And also her name has been connected with a number of local painters, Venetian painters, um, saying, oh, she must have been trained by this person or that person. We don't know who actually trained her. The sophistication of her work uh, does suggest that she did have some training because uh, it's certainly not um, self-taught, primitive. She actually started painting miniatures and uh, snuff box lids uh, for the tourist trade. Uh, she, as I said, she came from fairly humble origins and they were looking at ways of making some money. And some of these snuff box lids had, uh, were of ivory and so she introduces ivory as a new surface for miniatures. By 1700, she is selling her miniatures, and a family friend, uh, the, ca the canon Romelli, uh, was in Rome, and he sent her back a box of pastels, uh, evidently a very elaborate box. And so she started using this new medium, and uh, we have uh, from 1703 her first recorded pastel portrait. By 1705, she had been elected an honorary member of the Academy of St. Luke in Rome. Now the Academia, uh, the, or the Academy of St. Luke is the oldest of the European painters' academies. And the title uh, of these um, honorary members was uh, Academ Academico di Merito. Academico di Merito. Now the O ending, um, it would be Academician of Merit. And the O ending, it'd be a masculine ending. So I can't help but wonder if they didn't call her an Academica uh, di Marito. Who knows? Uh, she had many uh, patrons from the nobility, and one who was a particularly important painter was August III of Poland, who was the Elector of Saxony, the King of Poland, and the Grand Duke, Duke of Lithuania. Uh, he collected 150 pastels by Rosa Alba Carrera, and these are now part of the uh, collection of the Dresden Gamalda Galleria. In 1716, uh, she met a Parisian banker and art collector, Pierre Cosson, and uh, she was, of course, he was in Italy, and uh, he met her. And he was impressed by her work and by her, and he invited her to Paris. So in 1720, she goes to Paris. Uh, she's introduced uh, by uh, Croissant. And she has both a artistic and social triumph in Paris. Uh, she's evidently not only an artist, but she is also a um, musician. Of course, you know, women were supposed to be accomplished in music. Uh, and so she has a little concert that she puts on, and everybody is much taken by both her and her artwork. And she is, uh, becomes a member of the French Academy, the French Royal Academy. What we're looking now is one of her self-portraits. Uh, she does a number, and we'll show you several of them. 
Um, this was one from 1715. It is a pastel portrait. It's in the Uffizi Gallery. And as you can see, she's holding up another portrait that she's created. And this is a portrait of her sister, Giovanna. Uh, Giovanna uh, was her assistant. And uh, she assisted her in painting and did all the things that a painter's assistant would do. Uh, they evidently were very, very close. And uh, Rosalba was heartbroken when Giovanna died. Uh, this is another one of her self-portraits. As you can see, she's getting a bit older here. Uh, and it's her self-portrait as an allegory of winter. She did do a series of uh, allegorical paintings of the four seasons of the year, each personified by a beautiful young lady. Uh, this, is, this is a bit separate, though, because it's actually a self-portrait. Uh, so it combines the idea of allegory, of uh, a personification, uh, with a portrait. And I think you can see here how this is just beautifully accomplished, the very free, um, very, very soft strokes that you see, um, just very, very soft forms and edges, uh, which is one of the things that Pastel could do. And you also keep thinking, well, she's in the winter of her life. You know, she's uh, uh, showing herself both as an older woman and then one of the interesting things is she's showing winter, of course, is the fur uh, she's wearing because it's cold. But at the same time, the fur is ermine, which was a royal fur. And so um, Borzello, who has written a book about the self-portraits of women artists, suggests that perhaps there was a little uh, double meaning here. It wasn't just winter, but perhaps she was suggesting that she herself was the queen of the artists, which at that time, uh, she was. And in fact, um, for, during the 18th century, if you want to say a woman artist was a great, great artist, you might compare her to Rosalba Carrera. Uh, here are several more of her self-portraits. Uh, she's getting older, what in old age. Um, I thought it was rather interesting. I couldn't find any commentary on it, but uh, in this uh, portrait of her when she's probably around 70, she's uh, much older, um, you can see she's wearing a laurel wreath. And so that once again suggests uh, an idea that's been popular since the Renaissance of the, uh, the um, equality of poets and painters, uh, that in some way you know, she also deserves the laurel wreath uh, as the symbol of, uh, of a, a symbol of a poet only with painting here. Uh, one of the sad things is that she did gradually lose her eyesight, and by the time she was 70, um, she had lost her eyesight and was, of course, no longer able to work. Now let's look at some of the portraits of other people. This is one of the paintings uh, that marked her success in Paris, and as you can see, it's a painting of the most famous French Rococo painter, Watteau. Uh, Watteau was a painter to the royal court, and of course, uh, Rose Alba also uh, was no one in aristocratic circles. Now, this particular pastel uh, is shown uh, with a, a pose that we see very frequently in Rose Alba Carrera's work. Uh, usually the body will be turned, sometimes three-quarter view, here perhaps seven-eighths of view. Uh, the body may be turned away from the picture plane. And then the head turns out to face the viewer. Maybe not completely frontal. Here it's more of a three-quarter view. Uh, but the figure is looking at the viewer. And most of her work is bust length. Uh, a few of them are slightly longer. Uh, you may have the arms. Uh, but that's the, the usual format. And yet within this restricted format, she does manage to get a lot of variety. And she has, of course, this beautiful deft touch uh, very, very soft. Uh, she returns to, to uh, Venice. Uh, she has a, a, continues to have a success in Italy. Um, the the uh, Reynaldo de Esta, and the de Esta family is the leading uh, family in Ferrara. Uh, the de Esta family had her pa paint uh, portraits of his three daughters for their prospective grooms and all found husbands. What could be a better advertisement <laughs> than that? Um, she was invited to Vienna uh, by Charles VI, and uh, she stayed there for several years. Uh, here's some more of her images, uh, this one of an English duke, Charles Saxville, the Duke 
of Dorset. So this one is a bit more than uh, just bus length. Uh, it uh, shows off his uh, beautiful uh, patterned garment, uh, machine, uh, satin. And uh, of course, he's looking at us uh, very intently. Uh, just can have a sense of character and, and of the, the real live person, uh, not just the features. Uh, Cardinal Melchior. Uh, so here we have uh, one of the princes of the church. And she also did pictures, uh, as you can imagine, of children. Um, the picture on the left, the child of the Le Bon, Le bon family, she, he's holding, he or she is holding a little um, pastry, little sweet paper, sweet roll, uh, which gives us something of a, you know, a childish thing to do. Um, it's very interesting when I was looking at this, um, I found this picture on the web, and I found that most of the, the sites were saying that it was a young lady. Um, and then I found uh, one who was describing it in German, and it's called a Kanabe, which is a young boy. So perhaps uh, I'll just stick with child. Uh, dressed, uh, you know, beautifully, uh, the way an aristocratic child would be dressed. Um, but just by giving you a slightly knowing look, the children sometimes had a little, a little like, I'm growing up. And yet there's the little sweet roll that suggests, um, you know, the youth and a little bit more informal, perhaps, than what we're seeing right next to it, which is the uh, King of France, uh, Louis XV, as a young man. And uh, he is dressed uh, in all the splendor of a king. Um, I, uh, I don't know if that's his own hair or a wig, but it certainly looks like the great curled wigs that, uh, um, that uh, we often see, uh, see him wearing you know, as an adult as well. Uh, so, you know, no chance to be a child there, uh, showing, however, uh, the, the softness of the portraits that she does. Now, one of the interesting things is that within this format, she also manages to give us some classical subjects and allegorical subjects. Uh, this young lady is holding a cock, a rooster, and uh, this is the symbol of vigilance. So just by adding a little attribute, uh, a little object or an, an object that has symbolic meaning, uh, so she suggests uh, an allegory here of vigilance. Um, here we have Diana, the Roman goddess of the hunt and moon, and uh, her attribute is the bow. It's a butts like figure, uh, but coming in a diagonal, coming in from the corner, as though she's leaning over, as though she's active, she's running, uh, she's uh, coming up very close to us. And here we see a nymph from Apollo's retinue uh, and uh, one of the uh, seasons of the year, primavera or spring. Uh, and this comes, of course, from a series of uh, four seasons of the year. And in these cases, uh, her young, um, she's showing allegorical figures, uh, the breast is exposed. Um, Rococo art is often very titillating uh, and uh, sometimes has uh, a strong sexual or erotic content. And uh, she's doing it in a fairly you know, demure, classical way, but certainly uh, there is uh, a bit of titillation in uh, the uh, partially dressed young ladies with classical and allegorical names. Uh, this one I thought was kind of interesting because it's America. Uh, she has a series of the four continents of the world. And of course, at this time, the four continents that were known uh, were, of course, Europe, Asia, Africa, and uh, the most newly discovered one, uh, America. And she, once again, she's just a few little attributes, a few little objects to tell us uh, you know, what this is. And she uses a little feathered headdress. It actually looks like it could be more of an ornament to a, uh, uh, a Rococo ball, perhaps. Uh, but uh, the uh, feathered headdress is supposed to indicate that this is a Native American as does the quiver uh, and the, uh, the arrow that she's holding. Uh, I have also seen this called Diana, but uh, evidently the documentation shows that it really is intended to be a representation, a personification of the, of, of the Americas, or of, of America, the new continent.